Um, so here's my my story. Uh, in 1971, uh, well, actually, I realized after talking last night that I never introduced myself or did anything formal at all. I just the engineer was at my elbow and I began pummeling him and then that just led out into the gray wastes of heaving rhetoric and never got back to anything approaching uh, an introduction and I've made allusions to my rationalism and so forth but my, my story is uh, sort of like the unsinkable Molly Brown I grew up in a coal mining town in Colorado, and I was always uh, a weird kid. While everybody else was playing Little League baseball, I was off in the dry arroyos near my home digging up fossils and, uh, uh, you know, being maladaptive in many different ways. And uh, the thing that I was always tracing or looking for was a kind of iridescence that adheres to certain kinds of matter, certain situations, and even certain kinds of people. So it started out with a fascination with uh, minerals, a rock hound, and then that led into fossils. And that led to butterflies, which was a lifelong obsession until so much pummeling with Buddhist ethics made me give it up a few years ago. But resentfully, I must say, uh, you know, Buddhism is fine, but no one knows the pleasure of the capture of a uh, birdwing or an ornithopterid in the jungles of Saram. I mean, you want to talk about hard wiring in the human organism? We've been insectivores for nine million years, and there's a, a thrill there in the capture of a large butterfly that... that well, sorry to drift off into. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> Iridescence, yes. And so then the butterflies sort of carried me along for a while, and then when puberty hit, uh, pineal symbolism overwhelmed everything else, and I got into rocketry. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the compounding of fuels and the launching of these things from the local baseball diamond and airport at incredible peril to myself and the people around me. And then I, so I discovered at a certain point, uh, I had always been a, a kind of a science chauvinist. And then at a certain point, I discovered art, literature, poetry, music, dance, theater, the whole of the humanities came flooding in. But the guiding aesthetic was always an aesthetic of the weird. I guess I should mention that I'm a double Scorpio. But the, the aesthetic of the weird drove me and uh, nothing was strange enough. I loved the science fiction films of the 1950s, and I was into the music of John Cage early, early on. And, of course, all of these things funneled me toward uh, psychedelics. I mean, psychedelics are like the quintessential essence of this aesthetic of the weird. Once you get to psychedelics, it's like you've hit the main vein of weird, you know? You, no more do you have to closet yourself in the attic with your copy of Hieronymus Bosch. Uh, it, it, you can now, you know, move out into the real thing. So that propelled me to a lot of traveling. And traveling, I think, is second or third in importance in the human experience. I mean, I would say uh, sexuality, psychedelic drugs, and travel. This is, uh, you know, my prescription for, uh, I don't know, destroying your digestive tract or something. <laughs> and I, uh, I went first to, to Africa 
and then to the Seychelles Islands, and then to India, and lived in Japan for a while, and then eventually went back to Asia. And uh, I had encountered LSD in, uh, in uh, Berkeley where I went as an undergraduate in the fall of 1965. That was the other thing about me. I was incredibly lucky in that a kid from a cow town in Colorado, I was able to find my way to ground zero of the cultural scene. I was able to put myself at the corner of Shattuck and Bancroft in the fall of 1965. So the whole thing was just being staged for my benefit. I thought. Well, so then I was became very interested in psychedelics, and I actually smoked DMT early in 1967, a tremendously fortuitous uh, moment in the history of my, uh, the development of my thinking. Apparently, uh, SRI, the army, was trying to develop a drug called BZ, which was an aerosol-delivered tryptamine that would, a hallucinogenic tryptamine that would be delivered by an artillery shell into a Vietnamese village. And while everybody was stoned on DMT, our boys would come in and kick butt or do whatever they do. And uh, a 55-gallon drum of solid DMT had been boosted off the back of a truck by some uh, Stanford graduate students. And um, I'm telling you, it was incredible. I mean, it was, uh, it's never been that good. I don't know what this stuff was exactly. A 55 gallon drum of. <laughs> there might be, actually, the search for the treasure of the Sierra Madre. <laughs> so I had this benchmark, you know, aha, DMT. And I took a fair bit of LSD in those undergraduate years at Berkeley, but I have to confess, it never, it was never easy for me. It always seemed like psychoanalytic Drano kind of and, and after each acid trip I would say my god I'm not going to do that again well of course then two weeks later I would be back to it uh, but and but I had was my style has always been to be a reader and to get to inform myself so I read the Doors of Perception and Havelock Ellis and Weir Mitchell, all these people I mentioned this afternoon. And I, what fascinated me was how they insisted on visions, particularly Havelock Ellis's descriptions of his masculine experiences, where he says, uh, you know, architectural ruins dripping with globular jewels, strange statuary leering from darkened doorways. And I said, hey, I want it. You know, where do we, how do I get that? And LSD didn't really do it for me, although on my most satisfying LSD trips, and this is just maybe a practical suggestion, were in the presence of good hashish. Hashish seems to be able to pull the pure translucency of LSD toward a much crazier, more psychedelic, more mushroomic-like place, at least for me. So then I went to India and I knocked around for a while and I quickly became incredibly disillusioned with all of that. I mean, I don't know, folks. Uh, my, everybody has different experiences and you can only judge your own path. But I just thought it was the most outrageous con that has ever come down the pike. That, you know, maybe millennia ago there was something going on, but it has been so enfolded by priestcraft and dogma and class consciousness and, and uh, everybody's out to con everybody else. And there you are. What do you know? I mean, these people have been at 
this for a thousand years and you fly in from Malibu, sugar and money heavy into their midst? Well, they know just exactly how to turn you every way but loose. And eventually all you ask is that they turn you loose, you know? Um, now I know there are people for whom this message is unwelcome who are within this room this evening. But I'm not knocking Indian spirituality. I think that there is a great wisdom about how to live that these world religions have accumulated. The problem was I was 23 years old and I wasn't interested in wisdom on how to live. I was interested in how do you get as loaded as possible and then be able to talk about it. So I uh, went through all these experiences and was abandoned by uh, the love of my life and all kinds of things happened. And eventually I decided that the answer lay in the Amazon. And so in uh, late 1970, I had been living in Vancouver, British Columbia. I couldn't enter the States because I had a price on my head. Not much of one, <laughs> but an uncomfortable situation to be in. So then I went to the Amazon for the first time with my brother and uh, uh, a couple of friends who came with me from the States and then we quickly made common cause with a woman down there and she came with us. So it was uh, two women and three guys and we were considering that we, no one, that I was the oldest and I was 25 years old, as I look back on it, we were an incredibly serious and well-informed group of, of 22 through 25-year-olds. And our intent, we had all graduated from the school of DMT. We were all post-revolutionary Berkeley communard types. And... Uh, we had collectively decided that the only hope lay in somehow getting into the DMT flash for longer than a minute to a minute and a half, and that the strategy for doing this must be then to go to the Amazon and explore these psychoactive uh, drugs. And the one that we were interested in is one that even today has yet to become an item on the Malibu consciousness uh, circuit. A drug called Ukuhe. Ukuhe, it's used only by the Witoto, Bora, and Muinani tribes of the lower Putumayo of Kamasari Amazonas in Colombia. Very limited uh, geographic area in a completely remote part of the Amazon and what was interesting to us was the anthropological reports were that they rolled it up, it was the resin of a tree, and that they rolled it up into little pills and that they took the little pills and then they would lie in their hammocks and they would speak to the little man. And so we said, this has got to be it. And, and Dick Schultes, Richard Evan Schultes of Harvard, had already published on the chemistry of Ukuhe, and it was definitely contained DMT. So we said, okay, these people have found the way into what we then called the beta level, just for shorthand. So the way into the beta level was to be achieved by Ukuhe. So we put together this expedition and we descended the Putumayo River, which is the border between Colombia and Ecuador and Peru, to a place called San Jose del Encanto on the Rio Igaraparana, which flows into the Putumayo there. And at that point, it's a 120-kilometer overland five-day walk to a remote mission called La Chorera. And the most places in the Amazon are historyless, but La Chorera had a very dark history behind it, which I didn't really know at the time. 
and probably very few people in this room have ever heard of or know anything about what's called the Putumayo rubber horror. What this was was a rehearsal for some of the, for Hiroshima, Auschwitz, you name it. It went on from 1912 to 15 in the Amazon when in a frantic effort to get natural rubber to fight the First World War, British banks bankrolled uh, an episode of genocidal brutality that is remarkable both for the depth of the horror and for how thoroughly it's been completely forgotten. And what they did, these British banks, is they financed this Peruvian mafia called the House of Arana to basically enslave Indians over a vast area of the Amazon and force them to extract the natural rubber under pain of death. And there are endless stories of the atrocities. Uh, uh, people had the soles of their feet removed by machete if they didn't meet the rubber quotas. And just nightmare after nightmare. If you want to read about it, there's uh, the British Royal High Commission under Roger Casement. And that was another story. You see, Roger Casement was the last man hung for homosexuality by the British Crown. He had been the British Consul General in Rio de Janeiro and had exposed this rubber atrocity and all the collusion of British banks and stuff like that. But a few years later, he expressed Irish sympathies, sympathies with the Easter Rising of 1919 and immediately the Foreign Office came forward with love letters between him and Parnell, the Irish revolutionary, and, and he was hung for being a homosexual. Uh, but anyway, La Chirera had this very dark history of these rubber atrocities. Well, we rolled in there and uh, Immediately, there began the unfolding over just about a three-week period. I mean, a very short length of time, from the 27th of February, 1971, until the 22nd of March. So a period of just under uh, four weeks. It was like the doorway was standing open. All rational expectation had to be put behind. It was as though our whole lives had built to this moment. And what was, what we thought was a quest for an obscure orally active tryptamine drug, it turned out it was more as though something, something which had been with us from the cradle, actually lured us to this extremely remote place where there was no way out, no radio, no communication of any sort, lured us to this place to then, to then begin this series of unfolding ideas. And these ideas that were released in that three-week period are basically all I've ever worked with. I haven't had an original thought since March of 1971, essentially. <laughs> it's just been endless recension and reworking of what happened there. Well, what happened was taking a lot of mushrooms and being in this incredibly natural, beautiful, low toxin environment. I mean, there was barely even radio waves in this place. It was so remote. It was like our minds began to dissolve back into the order of nature. And we began to discover what the order of nature actually is. And it took the form of an idea, which was a, which my brother, uh, Dennis, who's the pharmacologist of the gang, although he wasn't at the time, he has gone on to become the person he most was before he studied the subject. Now he is a molecular biologist, research pharmacologist, and drug designer. Then he was a 21-year-old kid with a rave. 
But he proposed that there was a way to take these psychedelic drugs and to use sound to cause a small number of these drug molecules to permanently bond into the DNA. The term for this is intercalate. And it's known now, although it wasn't known then, that many drugs do this. Many drugs do intercalate. You, you all know how DNA is a double helix with uh, uh, nucleotide rungs on the ladder. Well, certain molecules, especially certain drug molecules, can slide right in between the rungs of that ladder. And without imparting any physical deformation to the molecule, they can change its properties. In fact, this may be how psychedelic drugs work. Now, we're at the edge of known physiology and neurophysiology when we talk like this. One of the great puzzles of uh, biology, or human biology, is the persistence of memory. In other words, uh, it's said that every molecule in your body is uh, cycled within a five-year period that you know t six years ago there wasn't a single atom in your body that is now in your body the form persists but the matter is traded in and out except in one case which is the neurons do not trade out the neurons that you're born with are the neurons that you die with. So then the problem here is memory. Uh, you, you can be 70 years old and have an absolutely crystal clear memory of your first day of attending school in that red brick schoolhouse 65 years ago. Okay. Conservatively, seven times every molecule in your body has been swapped out. So where has this memory been all this time that you can pull it up with perfect clarity? This is a great mystery of metabolism, unsolved to this day. There are several possibilities. One possibility is that memories are not located in the body at all. Although suggesting this is no magic bullet, it raises a number of questions probably as difficult to solve as the original question for which this was proposed as a solution. Okay, what are the other possibilities? The memories must be stored then in the non-degrading part of the body. The non-degrading part of the body is the neural DNA. The cell nuclei of neurons don't change within your lifetime. Well, so then you, t you take this idea to an or uh, orthodox uh, uh, molecular biologist or neurophysiologist or geneticist, and they say, well, this is just bunk. I mean, in the first place, you don't understand the concept information. The kind of information which is stored in DNA is sequences of nucleotides which code for protein. To confuse that with an image of your great-grandmother's face is to just, you know, have such a, a mush of categories that it's hopeless to even talk to you. Okay, so that destroyed the supposition, but it didn't solve the problem of memory, yeah. What about the possibility that what happens when you remember that schoolhouse 65 years ago that you aren't remembering it you are remembering the last time you remembered it that you only actually remember that schoolhouse once and then every time after that all you remember is the last time you remembered it so what if you haven't remembered it for 50 years i mean this happens but but i'm suggesting that you're not remembering it each time you're only you're only remembering a snapshot of it you remember the last time you remembered it but what if that was more than that might be time ago? Yeah, that doesn't solve this problem of how is the memory trace able to persist. Well, so uh, Dennis's notion was 
he said that some form of superconductivity must be involved. Now, this was 1971. Superconductivity was not known to occur more than three-tenths of a degree above zero absolute. He said, no, there must be room temperature superconductivity going on in the DNA. This must be how the DNA preserves information. Now, if you know anything about superconductivity, it is the perfect uh, 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 physical phenomenon to use for preserving information because no information degrades in a superconducting circuit. Say you have a ring of supercooled gold and you impart an electric current to this ring. That current, barring interruption of the superconducting state, will circle that gold ring with zero resistance for eternity. Now, the only thing which can cause the superconducting phenomenon to cease is if a high energy source overwhelms the superconductivity, comes in from the outside and disrupts it. Now, think about the, co the problem that nature faces with the genetic machinery. The key to life is error-free copying. Wherever there's error, then there becomes mutation or problem or incompatibility. So all of the strategies of genetic preservation of information seek to maximize the absence of error. So the perfect mechanism for doing this would be a superconducting mechanism. Now you see the major cause of mutation in the natural environment is cosmic radiation, ambient cosmic rays, high energy particles that smash into the genome, physically collide with the DNA and break the bonds and disrupt the, uh, the message so that it can't be copied. Superconductivity would be the natural uh, medium to retard this process. So Dennis's notion was that the DNA was a kind of superconducting uh, storage device and that in fact what we call the Jungian unconscious or the racial memory or the genetic memory could be tapped into and that what a, what a drug trip is, is a neurotransmitter that competes with serotonin that then broadcasts off this genetic memory bank a slightly different slice of the catalog. Serotonin broadcasts are the equivalent of traffic and weather reports where it tells you how to get around in the world and where not to go and how to avoid problems. If you swap out the serotonin channel for the psilocybin channel, suddenly it's the equivalent of Pacifica Radio. It's running philosophy discussions and classical music from another planet, you see, uh, because the, the efficiency and the emphasis of these neurotransmitters is different. Well, so uh, we went through a series of startling revelations and uh, experiences using this idea because he was dead serious about doing this and decided that I would be the likely candidate for what he called hypercarbolation and that you know we would saturate me with drug molecules and then he would he knew how to do the thing to make an ordinary trip turn into the forever trip by locking these molecules into their bond sites. Oh, and that's the piece of the puzzle that I didn't explain that you might not realize. Uh, when a molecule is superconducting, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, when a molecule is at zero degrees absolute, it becomes superconducting. So if you can cool a molecule to that level, it will immediately bond 
permanently to whatever is physically nearby. So Dennis said, what you do is you take all these, uh, you, you saturate your body with these drug molecules, and then using a complex theory of harmonic canceling, which I won't regale you with this evening, he thought there was a way to f generate sound that would affect a very small number of these drug molecules and cause them actually to super conductively bond into the DNA. And then the trip would be permanent. The trip would be scripted into the genome, or at least for the life of the organism. And he suggested that if you make the DNA superconducting in this way, that eventually death is no problem. It's just sort of like a shedding. And you go into the rivers and the water and the air, and you become very tiny. You become the size of your DNA uh, nucleotide in nucleus. Uh, well, I thought that this was a very highly unlikely notion, so unlikely that since he was so gung-ho to try it, the best thing to do would be to just let it rip. And uh, if there was something there, that would be interesting, but that I was willing to bet dollars to donuts against it. Well, he set up the experiment, he did the experiment, and he had made very extravagant and inflated predictions about what would happen. He thought that you would literally give birth to your mind as a physical substance. I don't know whether it would flow out of your nose or where it would come from, but he, he thought that, that, that there was a kind of superconducting hyper... Uh, uh, translinguistic matter, he called it. He thought there was a way to dissolve the boundaries between matter and spirit and create an obsidian fluid that would be obedient to your own imagination, that would in fact be you. You would just preserve your body as a convenient reference point, but you would actually become this stuff I'm telling you. <laughs> so I thought, <laughs> sure, so try it. So, yeah, what's to lose? We, we didn't come all this way for nothing. You say you know what you're doing. Nobody else has a clue, so go for it. Well, what happened was uh, not what he predicted, but not nothing. And that was the great puzzlement of this experience because what happened was uh, immediately after this procedure was carried out, uh, I could tell that something had changed in me. And it was very hard. It took me a few hours to figure out what it was. And what it was was it was though uh, a switch had been thrown and I began to understand. That's all it was. It was, you know, Whitehead defines understanding as the apperception of pattern as such. And suddenly, I s began seeing things very differently. I began to see the relationships between things on one level and among levels. And, uh, I stopped sleeping. I didn't sleep for 11 days, effortlessly. And every night during this 11 days, I would, in the late evening, I would just become very, very impatient for all these people to go to bed, my, my companions, because the chatter of the camp in, would interrupt my thoughts and what I just wanted to do was I would just go in the jungle and I would just put my hand on a tree and I would just stand and think and think and think and think and think and it was this endless cascade it was not like a psychedelic trip there was no hallucination there was simply this unfoldment and it was like as though I was just filled to overflowing with gnosis. I would sit down on this ground and begin thinking 
and I would lose myself in my thoughts and when I would come back to my situation I would look down in front of myself and see that while I had been thinking my hands had built a fire out of small sticks it was as though everything was cognitive activity uh, Dennis went uh, what would be conventionally called a psychotic episode, but it wasn't a typical psychotic episode. It was a kind of uh, turning inside out so that he became, he, he in a single moment after the hypercarbolation, it was like he ended up at the other end of the universe, turned inside out and headed backwards and over the next 14 days he came through a progressive narrowing of his um, the, what he was identifying with so that first it was the whole universe then it was the galaxy then the solar system then each of the planets moving in then all life on earth then all mammals, then all human beings, then all Irish, then finally all the McKennas there ever were, and then finally the question was, was he him or me? And then he got that sorted out finally, and then he was fine, shaken, but fine. <laughs> We've now reached the 22nd of March, 1971, and I was just, I couldn't, I couldn't talk to anybody. I was uh, in, a, in a very, 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 very strange place. I mean, things went on, well, just as an example, because there wasn't much of this 3D stuff that you could, you could wrap your mind around. But everything was teaching me. Everything had a message for me. And I would go out into the jungle and I would, uh, I would raise my arms above my head and I would call the butterflies into me out of the jungle. And they would come, first in, by dozens and then by hundreds. And I would stand there and here's how the thought progression would go. I would, I would call the butterflies in and then I would, uh, it would move me to tears and so there I am standing covered with butterflies tears of joy streaming down my face and streaming down my face and streaming down my face and finally I begin thinking so now what <laughs> and, and, then, and then I think ah the people back at the camp who doubt me those bastards wait till they see this so then I would go to the camp and I would be smiling the tiny smile that only Buddhas can manage and I would invite them into the jungle to see something unannounced and so they would say well I don't know you're just uh, alright we'll go so then we would go into the jungle and I would raise my hands above my head and I would call the butterflies in and none would come. <laughs> and these people would just say, oh God, it's just, it's getting worse and worse and worse. Your brother is nuts. You have delusions of grand... This is pathetic. I mean, this is a mind in wreckage. This is the green hell. This is the thing we feared the most, you know? And <clears throat> so eventually, and any of you who are self-diagnosed as schizophrenic will agree with me on this, I'm sure, the key to surviving schizophrenia in one piece and avoiding massive intervention by the mental health care authorities is shut up. <laughs> shut up about it. Do not talk about it. All the, you, you, of course you can raise the dead and heal the sick and divine distant events, but just shut up about it or you're not going to make it through. Well, eventually everybody else sort of renegotiated themselves back to some kind of reality. My brother flew back to the States and I was, uh, in a sense, left. 
worked in the Amazon to, to mull all this. So is there unfinished business from, uh, from last night? Yeah.